This is draft season. We're back for another episode. Apologize for missing last week, but unless you want to see me zoom from my bed with strep throat, you're probably happy that we didn't do an episode. <laughs> but back on the horse, feeling good. John Schmelk, Tony Pauline from Sports Keto with you. Tony, you did a little scouting on the road this week. Check it out. Yeah. Ohio State, huh? Ohio State versus Maryland. Yes. <clears throat> Parents weekend in Ohio State. Went to visit my daughter and got a little work done. It's uh, it's a great scene. I mean, you know, uh, NFL football is one thing, but the college scene, especially with a place like Ohio State where the stadium is right on campus, is outstanding. I saw a game that was actually very good for about two and a half quarters, almost three quarters, because Maryland kept it close. Uh, got to see a lot of next level talent. Some of the players that you know, like Marvin Harrison and Igbuka, who got hurt later in the game, looked like he hurt his ankle. But Marvin Harrison is basically unstoppable. I don't know why Ohio State doesn't throw the ball to him more. So some disappointing players, Michael Hall of uh, Ohio State really has not played well. Their offensive linemen, uh, Jackson and Jones on the interior haven't played well. So some good players from Maryland as well. They got <clears throat> two outstanding safeties. Bo Braid, the senior, and Dante Trader, the junior. I thought those guys were terrific. Uh, they also have a very underrated linebacker by the name of Ruben Hippolyte, who just is all over the field making tackles. Probably he's not going to be drafted, but he's a guy to keep an eye on as a priority free agent. And they also have a, a real good tight end. His name is Corey Dyches, who's an outstanding pass catcher. <clears throat> he's a solid blocker. He's a little bit small, though. You, you could tell when you well, – that's one of the advantages of seeing these guys on, on, in person. You could tell their body types, their frames. And Dyches, I was so surprised at how small he was seeing him in action. All right, so today, folks, we're going to have a fun show. We're going to start kind of going position by position here. We decided to start with the fun guys. So we're going to talk about the guys that have the ball in their hands. We're going to start with some of the weapons on offense. We're going to go – Running back, we're going to go wide receiver, and then depending on how long we're going, we'll see if we have time for tight ends during this show. So, Tony, let's get started. I know running backs is, is not the, you know, cool position anymore that everyone wants to draft high, yet every year you still have running backs that make a difference at the next level in the National Football League. I think uh, just from my perspective with the Giants, we've seen the impact not having Saquon Barkley has had on this Giants offense for sure since he got hurt. So, Let's talk about the running backs here, Tone, and we are in agreement. I've looked at a lot of these guys just like you have. Don't see that surefire first-round pick of the group this year, right? I don't even see, I do not even see a top 45 pick you know, in the group right now. And, you know, we're coming off of a couple of drafts where you had B. John Robinson go early in the first round, Jameer Gibbs. You've had guys like Grease Hall and, and Kenneth Walker who were top 45 picks who made an impact – I mean, I like the running back class, but right now I see more situational type of ball carriers rather than the quote unquote feature runners. Yeah, I agree. And and let's start with one of those guys. We'll start with the rival of the team that you scouted in person this week. That is Michigan. They have a couple of backs. Why don't we have both of them first but, uh, before we move on to some of the other guys? Blake Corm, you have ranked as your number one running back. And the thing about Blake, just 5'8", but he is 213 pounds. He's very unique body type wise. And when I watched him, Tony, you know, you see stuff that'll make that allow him to succeed. He's so low to the ground. He has kind of that Maurice Jones drew quick change of direction thing going good vision, but he just doesn't have that long speed you're looking for from the spot. Good burst, good pass catcher out of the backfield runs hard on the inside. Outstanding vision does a great job seeing the field, setting up his blocks, following his blocks, Runs hard on the inside. He's not a guy that shies away from contact. I mean, he'll take it to defenders, uh, you know, with that 215-pound frame. But as you mentioned, he's a little bit short, which sometimes can pose a problem in the passing game. Quarterbacks can't see him. Uh, you, you know, he's not a home run hitter. He's sort of in between. I love Blake Corum, the football player. I absolutely love him as a football player. But when you take into consideration the computer numbers, the size and the speed, you know, that's why he's not a – top 45 pick on my board that's why he's more you know second half of day two of the draft great football player i have no doubt he's going to succeed the next level in a, you know as a, in, in a situational role i just don't think he's an early draft pick yeah tony watching him i feel like when he does his testing he's going to have a dynamite three cone but that 40 yard dash time is not going to be great but you got to look at the 10 you got and it's one of those situations where yeah. i i still think he, you know he'll run in the four fives 
but you got to look at the 10 because he's got a good initial burst and he's, he's super quick, which, you know, is very important. He's able to cut back. He's able to make defenders miss. But again, that's why we're talking, you know, overall, he's my number one back. There are some scouts that have him as a third round pick. There are some scouts that have him as a fifth round pick, but you know, he's indicative of this class. He's real good in certain areas, but he's not the complete package. Yeah, I love the way you describe him. He does have burst. He kind of gets slow to the hole once he see it. Once he sees it open, he bursts right through, and he gets real small too with his frame. It's easy for him to kind of get through those small spaces in the hole. I agree with you. I think he's going to be a good NFL player, but he's not going to be that dynamic guy that teams are going to target early at that position. His teammate Donovan Edwards, Tony, six one two ten. At least that's what he's listed at. I was impressed by him last year. He just hasn't had that many opportunities this year. Just 50 carries playing behind Quorum, and he really hasn't broken that many long runs yet, something he did do a lot last season. You got to remember, Quorum was a little bit injured in the later half of last year. I think he hurt his knee in that uh, Illinois game, and Edwards came to the forefront. Edwards has that size and speed that Blake Quorum doesn't. He's got those computer numbers that teams want the next level. He plays, he's very athletic uh, on the field. He plays to those numbers, and he's an exceptional pass catcher. The problem is, is he's playing behind Blake Quorum. So I think what could happen with Edwards is he's one of those guys. I have him right now as a third round choice, uh, third round pick on my board, third round grade, I should say. He's one of those guys that, you know, could be taken later on because of doesn't have the great production, but he could turn out to be a real good NFL back. Yeah. You have him right now as, as the fourth guy on, on your list in terms of your running back. So let's jump back up to who you have at number two. We're going to go down South to Florida state, Tony, Trey Benson, and I had watched him on, on TV a lot this year because they've played a couple of really good games, Florida State. I took a look at his film over the last couple of days. You know, you watch him, he kind of has that like pitter-patter, pitter-patter, really quick feet, and then boom, he's kind of off. And you see the traits with him. He has some ability. He absolutely does, and he really kicked it into gear this week against Virginia Tech. Kind of started slow, but you, you, you said it perfectly. I mean, he'll wait, he'll be patient, he'll wait for the blocks to develop, He'll, he'll, you know, he'll basically dart around the defenders and boom. I mean, he is prone to picking up huge chunks of yardage from the line of scrimmage. I mean, he's a terrific interior runner. I don't think he's a pure perimeter runner, but he's a hard-nosed interior runner with great vision, has that burst, can pick up, uh, you know, a lot a lot of yards from the line of scrimmage. Doesn't have great pass-catching production. I don't know whether that's you know, indicative of the system that Florida State runs where they just don't run, uh, throw a lot to the uh, running backs because they've got two outstanding uh, receivers there or whether he's just a bad pass catcher. We'll have to see that, that in the lead up to the draft if he enters the draft. But I think he's a really good running back and really the next big time running back to come out of Florida State. Yeah, I guess Dalvin Cook was the last one, right? I don't... Who's the kid who hurt his Achilles? Who, who was with the Rams for a while. Didn't the Rams just trade him? Oh, Cam Akers. Yeah, that's a good one too. Cam Akers as well. Yeah, and he those plays are... a lot like Cam Akers. I mean, he's a lot like he has that. He's got that sort of style, of Cam Akers style. Absolutely. You know, one other thing too, I'll note with him, and I think we've seen this with the running backs that have had a lot of success in the NFL coming out of college recently, Tony. He's 223 pounds. Like, this is not a small back. This is a guy that you can put 18, 20 carries on his shoulders at the next level if you want to. And he runs hard. I, I mean, you know, you, you got to watch these guys. Are they physical? Are they aggressive? Do they take it to defenders? Or do they finish plays by running out of bounds? He doesn't do that, uh, Benson. I mean, he runs hard on the inside. He works his runs. He'll drive his shoulders through defenders. He'll fall forward for when he's tackled, which is important because you get that extra yardage. You know, if it's third and four and he's tackled, uh, uh, you know, at three yards from the line of scrimmage and then he falls forward, good chance he gets that first down. Those are the things, the traits that I like about Benson. All right, let, let's jump to the next guy on your list, number three, and that's Bucky Irving out of Oregon. Talk about a different body type than Trey Benson, 5'10", just 195 pounds. The first thing... And the first word that came to mind when I watched him, Tony, was jitterbug. This guy can just bounce around. He's so quick left to right. He's got speed. He's slippery. He breaks tackles. You know, he's a really good college back. I, but to your point that you made generally about this class, I think he's going to have to have a specific role in the NFL. And, and the thing about uh, the thing I like about Irvin, Irving is, you know, you mentioned the jitterbug and the quickness. You got to have good instincts and good running vision to know which way you're going to turn. And he's got it. He does a great job using his blocks. Yeah. If the guy's blocking uh, outside leverage. He goes inside. Another guy who runs hard. They, they've been sharing the ball at Oregon this year. They really haven't needed him to really step up. So his, his overall production is down, but his yards per carry is very high. 
Uh, I like him as a situational ball carrier. He can also catch the pass, uh, catch the ball out of the backfield, does a real good job about it. You know, that's one thing. We talk about the running style. Can, can, the, uh, can he block? Can he catch the ball out of the backfield? Is he just a screen pass receiver out of the backfield, or can he get down the sidelines and make big plays as a pass catcher? Irving does that as a pass catcher. Yeah, and at his size, he'll have to do that in the National Football League for sure. And, Tony, uh, just real quick, because we're going to talk about a couple guys on the other team coming up here too. If there's one game to watch this weekend in college football, for me, it's Oregon and Washington. Both those teams have played well this year, and there are a ton of NFL prospects on both of those rosters. Especially Washington, the defensive side of the ball. They've got some good defensive linemen. They got some good players in the secondary. So this is going to be a big test for Bucky Irvin, Bo Nix, as well as the rest of the Oregon Ducks. All right, and now let's go about and Michael Penix. I mean, everybody talks about Michael Penix as well. They should the quarterback from Washington, who's having an outstanding year. But Washington is a very strong on the defensive side of the ball, as far as the NFL prospects are concerned. Yeah, and we'll also have a couple wide receivers for Washington, too, that yep. Penix will be throwing the ball to. That'll be exciting to watch. We'll talk about them in just a little bit. All right, let's go to you. Donovan Edwards at four. We already talked about him, Tony. Jason McClellan coming in number five. When I watched it, I'm like, yeah, this guy just looks like an uh, looks like an Alabama running back. <laughs> he's 5'11", he's 212. You know, maybe not the most dynamic athlete, Tony, but he's downhill. He's one cut. He does have speed to pop the ball outside if he needs to. He can break tackles. But, you know, he, he's a guy that's going to be dependable, and I think he's he's going to be a guy that I think NFL teams is someone that, you know, maybe not a star, but somebody that you can give the ball to and you know he's going to do a good job with it. Starting to get better. Really starting to kick it into gear. Remember, you know, he didn't see the ball too much last year because of Jameer Gibbs. Now, all of a sudden, he's the feature ball carry. He seems to be getting better and better. The Alabama offensive line has been up and down at times. I like Jason McClellan. I like Jason McClellan more now in the middle of October than I did in the beginning of September. So let's see what happens as we go through October, through November. A guy who's got a lot of upside, a big pounder on the inside who's got good vision. But again, someone who's showing a progressing game. Yeah, and it's funny. I think all these Alabama guys, even the running backs for me, Tony, they're all going from Alabama and the receivers. They're all going to be affected in some way, shape, or form by their issues at quarterback, where teams just don't have to worry about that passing game as much, and it just makes it difficult for all the other skilled guys. Yeah, but again, I, with McClellan, you know, he's more advanced now than he was in, in September, and he barely got the ball last year because they didn't need him to get the ball because of Jameer right. Gibbs. Yeah, and he is a senior, so maybe that's a guy that we could see um, at the Senior Bowl as well, depending on how he develops and if he graduates over the course of the year as well, something we'll keep an eye on um, at the running back position. All right, let's go to a couple Ohio State guys here, Tony, next. You have Mayan Williams and Trevion Henderson. You have those guys at number six and eight on your list here. Give me a little compare and contrast on those two guys. How are they similar? How are they different? What do you like about both? Henderson's more the speed guy, the guy who's going to be able to turn the corner while uh, Mayan Williams is more your downhill pounder. He's more of the grinder. I think Mayan Williams, I have him rated higher than most. I like his game. Uh, I, I think he's a, he's a tough interior ball carrier. Where Henderson, if you're looking for a guy to turn the corner, get around the perimeter, give him the ball in space, and make a, a, and pick up your, uh, big yards from the line of scrimmage, that's, that's the type of running back he is. He can also run on the inside. There's no doubt about it. But it's just that uh, Williams is a little bit better uh, than Henderson running on the in, in, inside of running downhill. Yeah, Henderson 5'10", 214. You know, I watched his tape last year, and he was kind of dealing with an injury a little bit, Tony. He just didn't look all that explosive to me, and I thought he did kind of lean into being more of that tough interior runner. But you go back to his 2021 tape, you kind of saw that explosiveness and the speed, and I think that's come back a little bit this year, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I was going to say that. Even this year, I mean, you can see that he is the speed guy, that they're, he is the guy that, you know, when they're going to run on the outside, they're going to give the ball to him, and he does a good job. And the problem at Ohio State is their offensive line, specifically their offensive tackles, are, are a fraction of what we're used to, uh, the Buckeye program uh, basically coming coming out with. What do you think about those two in the passing game? I, They're okay. I, I mean, they're they're not, say, like a Bucky Irvin. They're not a Donovan Edwards. They're solid. They're, they're not – they're more of your safety valve receivers. They're not guys who are going to get downfield – uh, and, and make play, big plays for you on a continuous basis. Uh, more of your blockers, your safety valve, uh, screen pass uh, catchers. Uh, a lot of the problem, especially this year, is the quarterback at Ohio State who's having a lot of issues. Yeah, that, that's another program that's trying to figure out the quarterback problem as well. All right, uh, kind of sandwich in between those two guys, Tony. You have Montreal Johnson 
out of Florida. I, I love ATN, Travis ATN's yeah. younger brother. He's not draft eligible yet, but when he is, boy, talk about a guy with some juice. That guy's got some juice. He's going to yeah. be a hell of a football player. And Johnson's kind of the foil to that. He's kind of more of your bigger bruising type of back, correct? Your short yardage ball carrier, goal line ball carrier, your complement to ATN, but those types of backs are still needed. And all Florida backs are usually decent pass catchers out of the backfield. And Johnson's not bad. You know, he's good in some areas. He's just not spectacular. And like most of the backs, he's not a complete ball carrier. He's got his, you know, the issues in certain areas of, of his game. Yeah. I, I love it. I can't wait till I can study ATN in more detail next year because that kid's going to be a player, man. Absolutely. I mean, there is your, you know, your, your Swiss army knife, as you like to say, you know, a guy who's a, an explosive, you can run him on the inside. You can turn the perimeter, good pass catcher, even has some return skills. All right. One more running back. I want to touch on specifically, and then I'll let you kind of hit on other guys that you maybe think are interesting that you're keeping an eye on. I really like Raheem Sanders out of Arkansas, Tony six, two, two, 21, really productive last year, 1400 yards, 10 touchdowns at 28 catches too. And I think for a man his size, he's a really good athlete. He can run through tackles. He can he can run. He can break away with some long speed. I was honestly, I was surprised to see him a little bit lower up on your list. I thought he'd be a little bit higher. Two hundred twenty one pounds is a good size for him. Right now, he's about two hundred forty five pounds. Is and he at two forty five right now? Not wow. Sanders is he's, he's overweight. He's not in shape. You know, he, he's not playing. He's not in the condition that he was in the past. Uh, you know, the, it's a little things off the field that I think are really going to hurt Sanders come draft day. And Tony, I'll be honest with you. I have not watched this tape from this year yet. I was going off from when I stayed in him last year. And it's been very average this year. I mean, you got to remember, Arkansas is in the middle of a four game slide. You know, they got a decent quarterback out there, a guy who, who, you know, who's an RPO type guy. They really need Sanders. I don't think he's responded all that well. And I think part of the problem is because he's not in shape. So, yeah, I mean, if he was 221 pounds and he was able to build off of what he showed last year, I would agree with you. There are some scouts I've spoken with that have uh, have a uh, undrafted grade on, on Sanders uh, because of the fact they don't think he's a multi-purpose versatile running back. And there's this knock that he's just not a hard worker. Yeah, interesting. We'll have to keep an eye on that over the course of the year if he can play his way into sit shape. But even if he does, that's already a red flag that a guy would show up in a draft eligible season, not being ready to go, Tony. I mean, th that's something that I know scares the heck out of scouts and NFL programs because then you're starting to worry about football character, right? Can you trust this guy once he gets that contract to do what it takes to succeed as a pro? Especially at a position like uh, you running back, because if you're overweight and out of shape, you know, not only uh, you're not, you don't have top fitness, I, I mean, you're prone to likely be being injured. And if you're injured and on the field, what good are you doing to the team? So it's going to be interesting to see how Sanders does through the process. If he enters a draft, and what kind of shape he's in, the whole interview process and everything else. Yeah, and a position where you got to play through injuries and stuff like that, where, you know, there's a lot of times not a lot of glory there, and you have to, you know, deal with a lot of stuff and kind of play through it. So something to keep an eye on over the course of the year. All right, Tony, that's your top, let's see, I think we went through 10 guys. Anyone else below on this list that, that really jumps out of you, that kind of has you excited that you think fans should know about? Uh, you got to watch Carson Steele from UCLA, the transfer from uh, from the MAC. I think it was uh, Ball State. Uh, I may, be, may need to be corrected on that. But, uh, you know, a very productive back. He's doing a great job at UCLA, a guy who just puts his head down and runs downhill and runs over people, pick, has, be, has done a real good job. We talked about Troy Benson. I like his teammate Lawrence Tofili a lot. Doesn't get the carries, but he's, he's sort of – uh, like the Donovan Edwards, if you will, at Michigan, in the sense that he is the, the number two back. He's on the field. He shows flashes. He's a guy that's got a lot of upside potential. And because he's not really going to get to de develop his game because of Benson, he could be a real good back down the road. If you're looking for a small school sleeper, Isaiah Davis out of South Dakota State. He goes about 225 pounds. You want to talk about that pitter-patter, that, that short area quickness, that good footwork to be able to run around or dart around defenders. Davis has got it, but he's also a downhill grinder, pounds it on the inside. He's a good short yardage back, real good multi-purpose uh, type of ball carrier. I don't think he's going to be drafted early because he's probably going to run in the four, high four fives, low four sixes. But he's going to be a good situational type of short yardage back, even first down run at the next level. It really falls off after that. I mean, Elijah Green of North Carolina, you're, you're talking, you know, three times as many or twice as many day three running backs as you are top 100 running backs. 
And I think that's just not because of the numbers, but because of the separation and talent from the top guys in this draft who really are not what we're used to seeing in the past couple of drafts. All right, let's jump over to wide receivers now, Tony. And, you know, we, we throw bouquets at this guy every week and understandably so, because he's frankly the best wide receiver prospect we've, you know, we've, we've seen since Jamar Chase. Uh, I know some people even go back further than that, depending on what people, you know, grades people had on Chase when he came out. But Marvin Harrison Jr. is wonderful. He's big, he's strong, he's fast, he can catch it, he can do all those things. When I was at the game Saturday, I, really from the get-go, Marvin Harrison was in one-on-one coverage at the top of the field, and everything on the other side of the field was busy, and I couldn't understand why Ohio State just didn't throw the ball to Marvin Harrison and, and, and exploit the matchup. They finally, and the game was close for two and a half quarters. Finally, towards the end of the third quarter, they just started throwing the ball towards Marvin Harrison. And guess what? They then ran away with the game because you can't stop Marvin Harrison. He was making great over-the-shoulder reception. He was coming away with contested catches. He's long, but he's also fluid and smooth. And when he's got to get up and adjust and contort to come away with the catch because the, the quarterbacks made never throw, he does it. He's got soft hands. He's got a fluid style. Uh, you know, when we talked with Bruce Feldman in the first show that we did, Bruce talked about how he's working on his short shuttle and his three cone time. Uh, that tells you something about the guy, about his work ethic, you know, the, the, the good bloodlines there. He knows what he's got to work on him. You know, most people, most draft uh, draft prospects aren't working on their combine uh, testing until they finish the season and, and start training for the combine, start tra- get ready for the draft. Marvin Harrison, according to Bruce Feldman, was doing it, you know, in the in the off season in the summer. Uh, you know, there's a lot to like about him. I think he's going to be a top six pick. I think a team, a, a receiver needy team at the top, maybe the Chicago Bears, who've got uh, who going to have multiple early picks, will we'll be looking to pluck Marvin Harrison off the board very early. Right now, would you be overly surprised? Sort of surprised? Shocked if he is not the first non quarterback taken? Um, it depends on the order, uh, because you got a couple of good left tackles like Fashanu of uh, Penn state. And, uh, you know, if there's a team up there that is just desperate for all we go back to Chicago bears, right. Who's got two, <laughs> uh, two early picks. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, if there's a, the, the, me- if there, the, the need is there for a left tackle and they like Fashano, I could see a team taking Fashano uh, before uh, Marvin Harrison. But you think I, those right? Well, no, no. Harrison will be graded higher. Mm-hmm. But again, you know, everybody talks about the quarterback position, how important it is on draft day. So is the left tackle position. You think right now those would be your two non-quarterbacks that are going to be your highest graded players, if you consider position value in there as well, or is somebody else you think it'd be in that mix? Well, I don't see any. I, I Brock Bowers isn't going to go that high. Uh, Chop Rob McHistory is not going to go that high. Yeah, it's it absolutely will be after Celeb Williams. If there's not another quarterback, take him, say, like Drake May. I think Caleb right Williams, now, right? You mean uh, Caleb Williams? Uh, Caleb Williams. I'm yeah. sorry. Caleb Williams uh, is the first to, uh, player selected. If Drake May isn't the second player selected, I think it'll be a battle between Marvin Harrison and Fashano of Penn State. Although Brock Bowers, I have rated higher than Fashano, I can't see a team taking uh, a tight end you know, that early over a left tackle. Absolutely. All right. We talked about Marvin Harrison. So let's take a look at the wide receiver class in general, Tony, your take on how this class compares to maybe some of the classes we've seen over the past few years. Kind of falls off the cliff after Marvin Harrison. And it's, it's got decent depth in day two, but you don't have any stars. I don't think it's going to be like a couple of years ago when we had what five, six receivers selected in top 16 picks of round one. I, I don't see any of that happening. I think uh, Emeka Ebuka, uh, Harrison's teammate, is going to be the second receiver off the board if he enters the draft, though it's going to be in the bottom half of round one. Donnie Mitchell of Texas could be a late first-round pick. Again, bottom half of round one. Xavier Worthy, I have a second-round grade on him. He could be a first-round pick if a team's looking for a speed receiver, big play uh, type of guy. But I think overall, it's kind of – it pales in comparison to recent years – and again, where we had what five, six guy uh, receivers taking the first uh, sixteen picks a couple of years ago, you may have three or four receivers taking the first round and top thirty-two picks. 
All right, so let's talk about some of those guys you just mentioned, Tony. Emeka Egbuka, you mentioned he got banged up a little bit this week. I know you're a huge fan of his. Um, to me, I watch him, and he he's just a safe pick. You know, yeah. he does everything well. He's got good hands. He's a good route runner. You know, I don't fall off my chair or being wowed by his athleticism, but he's a good athlete. He gets open. He creates separation. And I, I just think he's somebody, if a team decides they want him as your number two wide receiver on a team, because I don't think he's a one. I think he's a two. I think that's a very safe pick to your point back half of that first round. Agree with everything you said. And it's going to come down to testing numbers for him. You know, is he a guy that can run the low four fours or is he a guy that's going to, you know, not be able to break four or five. If he doesn't break four or five, I don't think he gets in the first round, but he's very reliable. Like you said, I mean, he's fluid. He makes a tough catch in a crowd. He catches everything that's thrown to him. And more importantly, he's fundamentally sound. He extends his hands. He catches the ball with his hands away from his frame. Good eye hand coordination. Uh, you know, like the running backs that we talked about, there's a lot of nice things about his game, a lot of good things. He's very consistent. There's just no special, there's no, nothing special about his game, nothing that really stands out, except for the reliability and consistency, which is what you want. Which is what you want to stand out, exactly. The third guy on your list, Tony, Adonai Mitchell. I had not watched him uh, from his tape last year heading into this season. So as I got ready for the show, I made sure I watched a bunch of him heading into this program when we're taping this. And I got to tell you, I was really impressed. Some of the stuff he does at the stem, at the top of his routes, he puts defensive backs in a blender. You can, He has a good change of pace, varies his speeds to create separation. He had a couple one-on-ones against Kool-Aid McKinstry, who's considered the top cornerback in this draft. He had a play down the left sideline where McKinstry stayed with him, but he made a nice contested catch on him. Then he was one-on-one -on -one at the goal line, and he puts this move on him on a slant gets three or four yards of separation wide open for the easy touchdown. I was really impressed. And it's six, four, one ninety six tone. This guy has unbelievable movement speeds for a guy that height. Yeah. AJ green. Remember, remember, remember that name, AJ green. You know, if you tried to watch film on him last year, there wasn't really too much film to watch because I think he missed like nine, 10 games last year with an injury came back in the, that ironically Ohio state game in a semifinal game with, I believe with his first game back. And he was really good as a true freshman. In 2021, you could tell, and I wrote that this guy was going to be the next big star when he was playing for Georgia. He transferred from Georgia to Texas to be closer to home. He's really caught on well with Quinn Ewers. I mean, we're going to talk about his, his uh, teammate, Xavier Worthy. Xavier Worthy is more the big play guy, but Adani Mitchell is the more consistent guy. He's going to, he has big playability, but, you know, you throw him underneath routes, He's going to separate and he's going to catch everything. And he plays with balance. He plays with body control, good eye hand coordination, all, all the receiver fundamentals you like. And the fact is, is he seems to be getting better and better and better at, at Texas, which is a brand new program for him after he spent, you know, a season and a half catching passes from Stenson Bennett at Georgia. All right. And let, all right, let, let's get to Xavier Worthy and his teammate. He's the fourth guy in your list here. I mean, speed, 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 right. speed, and more speed. Uh, we talked about some of his ball tracking a little bit earlier on a program a couple weeks ago. Tony does a good job with that. Maybe the hands looking at this yeah. tape last year, not quite as consistent as you would like. Uh, I've seen the, the Hollywood Brown comparisons made given his size, you know, he's listed at just 163 pounds, but boy, this guy is a big play waiting to happen electrifying receiver without a doubt. I, I mean, he's the type of guy that he has the propensity to, to take it deep where the, a cornerback or even a safety is going to have to take a step or two back to guard against that deep speed. Uh, he is a guy that, you know, he's perfect for that Texas system. With Quinn Ewers, who throws the ball downfield. He's a great, he's an outstanding vertical receiver, but you mentioned it, the size, the, the inconsistency with the hands, because there's a lot of balls that go slipping through his hands. He doesn't look like he's got strong or soft hands. He can be a little bit malvy at times. Obviously, you know, with that big playability, maybe it's justified. Rather just see him shut up and play and catch uh, and catch the ball. Uh, you know, if, if a team is looking for that electrifying downfield threat, the vertical receiver to open up the offense, they're going to look towards James, James Worthy. Uh, I'm sorry, Xavier Worthy. James Worthy, date myself there. Xavier Worthy, when you get to that second tier of receivers after Marvin Harrison. If Xavier Worthy at James Worthy's size, we'd be talking about him like we were talking about Marvin Harrison Jr. All right, let's go to our next wide receiver, fifth guy on the list. Uh, Jermaine Burton, wide receiver of Alabama, Tony, six foot, 195 pounds. And when I mentioned during the running back conversation how you're going to have to filter a lot of these Alabama players through the quarterback play that they're dealing with, 
I think if Jermaine Burton had a Bryce Young, even a Mac Jones with him, I think we'd be talking about him, you know, a lot more because boy, he had a post corner against Texas when he just flies by everybody and he created a ridiculous amount of separation with the speed. I think he tracks the ball well deep. His route tree isn't quite as varied as I think you would like, but I think you certainly see the physical skills. And I think like Jace McClellan, he's a better he's a better player now than he was in the beginning of the season. He seems to be progressing. And that's what, I, I, anyway, I look for. I want to see a player who, you know, moving towards a draft is a better player at the end of the season before he enters the draft than he was before. And that's what Burton seems to show. Uh, you know, he doesn't have great deep speed, but he's a good vertical threat. And he's got good eye-hand coordination, catches the ball very well in stride, plays with excellent balance. Like you said, the up and downs of the uh, quarterback position in Alabama are not going to help him. But I like, you know, I like the trajectory of his game. All right, let's go to your sixth wide receiver here, Tony. Malik Neighbors, wide receiver at LSU, six foot, 195 pounds. I think I'm probably a little bit higher on him than you are. He plays a lot out of the slot, good speed. I think maybe his play strength could use a little bit of work, but you know, he's a guy that is very sudden. He is quick. He changes direction. Well, and he's been a really, he's developed a really nice connection with Jaden Daniels here as his go-to guy. When the season ends, his numbers are going to jump off the page to people. Really has been dominant uh, in much of the past four weeks. I mean, he's had performances in the Mississippi state game, a couple of others where, you know, they knew he was getting the ball. The defense knew they were, the ball was going to go to neighbors and they couldn't stop him. Uh, I mean, I like his game. I want to see what his true testing numbers are. I want to see what his true 40 time is, what his 10 split is. I want to see how he runs NFL routes when they do the uh, position drills at the combine. You know, I've said it time and time again until I'm blue in the face. LSU uh, receivers are usually better in the NFL than they are, are in college. And I think neighbors is really going to be the next in line uh, for that. Yeah, I think at the end of the year, we might have people talking about him as one of those potential late first round picks, Tony, given the production he might end up putting up by the time we get there. And again, we'll see, to your point, uh, what his testing numbers are as well. Trey Harris out of Ole Miss. This is a guy, Tony, that I had not watched coming into this year. 6'2", 205 pounds. You know, he's a different type of wide receiver than I think the guys we've talked about. He looks like one of those kind of stronger wide receivers to me. Does a good job of using his body to, to make himself available. He breaks some tackles after he makes the catch because of that strength. I'm just not sure I see a ton of separation ability when I watch him play and play out. Louisiana Tech transfer has really came out of the gate hot uh, early this year for Mississippi. Had some injury issues. Uh, you know, want to see how the consistency is from here on out. Want to see how the testing numbers are. But a guy who, you know, when he's on, he's sort of like Malik Neighbors. You can't stop him. I mean, they know the ball's going to him, and he just makes catch after catch after catch. And the production in some games is is, is just off the charts. He was highly thought of by scouts. I'm looking at my, uh, uh, my, my list here. There are some scouts that had him as a day two pick, which I have him right now. Again, a guy like that, he goes 205 pounds, a shade under six foot two. You know, his, four, his a draft grade will ultimately be determined – by his 40 time. If he's running the mid four fives, he's not, he's probably going to go later, later part of day two. Uh, if he runs in the four fours, he's going to go much earlier, but a real good pass catcher. Yeah, absolutely. When the ball gets in his area, he will come down with it. But yeah, that was my point with the separation stuff, right? I think seeing his testing and his athletic ability will be something that'll be interesting to watch. All right, let's go back out West here. We mentioned that fun game we're going to have between Washington and Oregon this weekend. One of the guys to watch is Tony Franklin, the Oregon wide receiver, Tony. He was already pretty productive last year. 61 catches, 891 yards, nine touchdowns, 6'3", but just 178 pounds, a bit of a string bean. But I thought for a guy of that height, he does move really, really well. Very smooth. And he's one of those guys that, you know, there's a lot of hype around him. And I never believe the hype machine. And I kind of go into watching the film, sadly, with a bad attitude. But then he'll make a big play. And I'm like, wow, you know, maybe I'm wrong on this guy. Uh, you know, he, he's a terrific vertical receiver. Outstanding eye-hand coordination. Does a great job making the play downfield. I'd like to see more consistency from him because he's the type of guy that, He'll make a couple of big plays and then he'll disappear. You know, you won't see him again. I'd like to see more consistently, whether that's Bo Nix, whether that's the system, uh, but he's not as say as dominant. He doesn't have those big numbers as the Malik neighbors or the, uh, the Trey Harris's does. He's not prone to that, but he is a guy who makes a lot of big plays down the field. 
Yeah, I have a lot of back shoulder catches on his tape from last year that you like. And, you know, at that size, you want a guy that can make those types of plays. If he's going to be like that X wide receiver on the, um, you know, boundary side of the field, we don't have a lot of room to operate. He's going to have to make those types of plays. All right, let's go to uh, his teammate, Tony. Uh, rather, one of the t- players that will be playing his team this week. Yep. Two wide receivers. I mentioned him earlier. Jalen McMillan and Rome Adunze. And Adunze was kind of the talk before the year. He was the guy I watched his tape last year. And I think we've mentioned him before in the show. We both see him as more of kind of a bigger possession receiver type. Though I know when we had um, our, our uh, show on the freaks list earlier, uh, this year with uh, Bruce Feldman, he said he's going to test out of the uh, out of the water. So we'll see how happens with that. But when you had him on his list, I had not watched Jalen McMillan yet, except by from watching him on TV. And I got to tell you, this guy impressed me. You want to talk about a guy with some juice? This guy's got some juice. He plays a lot in the slot, which is fine. He's 6'1", 192 pounds. You can see by the way the defensive backs react to him that he strikes some fear in them. That he gets to the top of that route, he can go side to side, he can get over the top, he's got speed. Uh, he did drop an easy touchdown pass this year, which I'm sure scouts aren't going to like. But, boy, this guy to me has some juice, Jalen McMillan. Adunze's got 25 pounds on McMillan, and they're probably not that far apart as far as 40 times concerned. But the thing is, is when you watch McMillan and you kind of touched on it, his route running is outstanding. I mean, he, he separates through his routes, which is – you know, as we saw with Jordan Addison last year, who couldn't break four or five, that's what teams want. It's not just about running four or three and running past everybody. Yeah. It's separating from them in those underneath, in those short and intermediate routes. And that's what McMillan does so well. And for the most part, he catches the ball very well, extends his hands, looks the ball in, soft and strong hands. Now, people are going to go salivate over the uh, the size and speed of a Dunze, and he's a good pass catcher. But he doesn't really play fast. And, you know, he's more win- winning out for the contested throw rather than separating it underneath coverage, rather than getting away from the defenders by exiting his routes, which is what McMillan does so well, which is why I have him rated slightly higher than a Dunze. It'll be interesting to see, you know, how it plays out moving forward. These were both, both of these guys probably could have been selected in the top 125 picks in last year's draft. I had reported broke the story that they were both staying in. It's turned out well for them, especially with the season that Michael Penix is having. Uh, but I think that, you know, I think a Dunze is going to be a very good NFL receiver. I just think when you look at the way the NFL is going, it's not just about being six foot three, 215 pounds. You can be 190 pounds if you can separate from defenders, if you can get open on a consistent basis. And that's what McMillan does. Yeah, and I honestly, Tony, I'm with you. I think that's what the NFL teams value more now. Um, I can tell you when the Giants scout receivers here, that's what they're looking for. You know, size is great, but they want guys that can give quarterbacks a window to get the ball in there. And McMillan consistently does that. And by the way, in different ways, it's not just side to side. It's over the top. He And that's why I think he kind of puts those defensive backs in, in, in such a tough spot at the top of the route tree. Absolutely. And he does it. Every time, yeah, I mean, every separate, time. it's not just, it's not just here and there. It's every single time, you know, he, he's separating his routes. He comes back to the ball. He gives the, the uh, quarterback a target to throw to, and, and he makes himself an available receiver. So that's our top 11. I want to do one more. That's Keon Coleman. Cause I know he's been getting a lot of love from other people out there that do draft stuff as a potential first round pick. And when you watch him on TV, Tony, I understand why you would think that he makes a lot of big plays. He does a really good job, but, When you watch him on tape, and you mentioned this on a previous program we talked about him, I do wonder how he's going to test because you don't see that separation ability that that, that, that I like to talk about. A lot of times the cornerbacks are really sticky to him. Now, to Coleman's credit, he does a great job of making catches anyway, even with those cornerbacks on top of him. But that gets a lot tougher when you're playing NFL defensive backs versus college defensive backs, right? So I agree. I didn't see that speed and explosiveness that I thought I would when I put on the all 22. You know, it's very easy to look at the highlights and see this guy, you know, this guy make acrobatic receptions on a week in week out basis and say, that's a first rounder, but you have to project to the next level. You know, we just talked about the difference between McMillan and Adunze in Washington that, you know, Keon, Keon Coleman is more the Adunze yeah. than anything else. And he's a big guy who wins out for the contested throws. It, it gets vertical, he high points the ball, takes a big hit and he, and he holds on to the throw. And that's great. 
occasionally in the NFL. You can't do that every day. I don't know. You're going to get your, you're going to get beaten. It's great in the red zone. You know, you want to have that bigger guy and throw the ball up and went out for the jump ball. But you got when you get, you know, as you're moving the ball down the field, you got to have your Jalen McMillans, if you will, or that type of receiver, you know, that can get separation. And Coleman just can't do that. He doesn't do that. Doesn't mean he's not going to be a good NFL receiver. In my opinion, it just means that he's not going to be an early pick. Uh, I mean, and and again, like Adunzi, even if he tests well, when you watch the film, he's not a guy, as you mentioned, that can separate from uh, cornerbacks, from defensive backs through his routes. As you mentioned, they stick right to him. So the guys who went out for the contested throw are important. But in this day and age of the NFL, you want more of those guys that consistently uh, separate through their routes. And Coleman isn't that guy. As I thought we would, Tony, we've gone more than a half hour here on just the running backs and receivers. Give me anyone else in this wide receiver list that you're excited about or you think fans should know about. Got to keep an eye on Ma- Malachi Corley of uh, of Western Kentucky. I mean, uh, he's a guy who I didn't understand why there was love for him in the scouting community because there are some scouts that have him great as a second-round pick. He's more of a uh, – he goes – where is he here? He's 5'10 and a half, 210 pounds, exceptionally quick. More of that McMillan, you know, guy who can separate through his routes, run after the catch is real good. Create charge can also uh, double as a return specialist. Uh, you, you look down the line, Jaleel Farouk of Oklahoma, who's starting to get some traction. A guy who was on my preseason watch list. He, you know, had a great game against Texas, helped uh, help the, the Sooners win that game. He's a guy moving forward. Lad McConkey, a lot of love for Lad McConkey in the uh, scouting uh, community, a guy who's more of your possession receiver had an injury. He's just coming back, uh, coming back onto the field, and that's about it. The big kid from um, South Carolina, who uh, his name escapes me, uh, Xavier—I forget his name. I apologize. Uh, a, a big, big body, uh, Xavier Leggett. I apologize, Xavier Leggett, who a lot of people love, really jumped onto the uh, scouting radar this year. Has made a lot of big catches, but again, he's more of your big body contested guy on the field i'm told that leggett is going to run in the four threes wow combine time but again you got to watch the film because he struggles separating through his routes i loved his dad as a receiver so real quick tony just give me 20 seconds how much is musin muhammad the third similar to his dad uh he's good i, I don't think i i've got him relatively highly rated um i i don't think i, I think he's a different type of guy in the sense that uh uh, he doesn't have great downfield speed, but he's he's been he's done very well at, at Texas A and M this year, or he's starting to turn it on, I should say, at Texas A and M this year. Good stuff, Tony. Always fun. Uh, we'll have more positions coming up next week. Look forward to it. For Tony Pauline, I'm John Schmelk. That's draft season. Stay tuned. We'll cover the draft for you as we continue uh, during the year here, as we uh, head towards uh, the fall. Autumn's coming here, and we'll have you covered with everything NFL draft right here on draft season. 